Welcome to Taxpayer Alert. My name is Al Sagawa. I'll be your moderator. And like most of our programs, well, all our programs are very interesting, but this one is especially so. Our guest is uh, John Manis, who's a, an investigator, but he's got such a background in law enforcement and uh, public defender's office and uh, investigations that uh, so any, probably any topic in those areas, he's going to know something about it and we can learn. Now, he's, uh, uh, he, he's uh, uh, in charge of uh, Mass Investigations, and he's, of course, the chief investigator. John, tell us about you. <laughs> Thank you, Al. <clears throat> As you know, I recently uh, semi-retired from a 35-year career in the criminal justice system. During that time, I spent seven and a half years as a police officer. And thereafter, I went to work for the Public Defender's Office when I discovered that they employ a lot of criminal investigators. In San Mateo County, when I started there, they had almost 40 investigators. So I went there, I fell in love with the job. I was an investigator uh, on a variety of cases, but um, toward the end, I specialized in homicide cases. And I did that for about 18 years before I was promoted to chief investigator. I then worked as the chief investigator for another 10 and a half years before I semi-retired. Three months into that semi-retirement, I, uh, I got word that the San Joaquin County Public Defender's Office was looking for a temporary chief uh, because their chief was out on a medical leave. I was told that it was going to last four to six months. So I thought, well, that's fine. I'll go help you out for four to six months. That lasted a year and a half to the day. <laughs> so, uh, I say semi-retired because somewhere along the way, about 20 years ago, my oldest son joined the Copperopolis Fire Protection District Fire Explorer Program. He was 16 years old, and uh, I took him down there and got him set up, and off he went to his first training. And he came back that night and he said, Dad, Dad, you, you got to come down here. you gotta, you got to meet these guys. They're, they're just awesome. You, you will love them. <laughs> I had no interest in, in becoming a firefighter. Uh, I had an opportunity when I was 21 years old to become a professional firefighter. And I turned it down, Al, because it was too dangerous. Yeah. Uh, you want to live. I wanted to live. And I think the need police work was not as dangerous. Uh, nevertheless, I told my son, I'll go with you to the next training session. And I, like he said, it's a great group of guys. We didn't have any women around at the time. That's, that's very different now. But at the time, it was an all, all, all boys club. Uh, it's a great group of guys. Uh, I thought I might want to hang out with them, and uh, so I, um, before I left, the fire chief handed me an application, and uh, I've been doing that ever since. Mm -hmm. I'm still doing that. Um, I have been on the board of directors for that fire district for over a decade, and for the past several years I've been the president of the board of directors. For Copperopolis Fire District? Yes. All right. You know, you could uh, write an interesting book that'd be fun for kids to read. Well, that's what I was going to do in my semi-retirement. <laughs> Things keep coming up. <laughs> yeah, I imagine you've had uh, some very interesting experiences over this, over this period of time um, that uh, could make a movie, maybe. <laughs> well, I know I could write more than one book. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the things that of interest to you is uh, the, uh, the staffing shortage that we may be experiencing with, uh, uh, and, and for firefighters. Is that true? It's true. It's uh, very true uh, here in Calaveras County, but it's also true um, statewide. And one of the reasons for that is last year, the governor decided to um, to shut down the fire camp program that is run by the Department of Corrections. 
So historically, uh, the Department of Corrections will take uh, select inmates. It's a volunteer program. They don't force any inmate to do anything. Yeah. It's a voluntary program. They um, select the inmates. They bring them in. They train them how to fight wildland fires in particular. Yeah. Um, although they don't usually fight too many structure fires, they are also trained to do that. And I have fought fires with those folks, structure fires. Yeah. Uh, so they do that sometimes, but primarily their mission is to assist with wildland fires. What was the reason to uh, kill that program? Well, frankly, I think it was totally political. Um, the the stated reason was it was uh, akin to slavery, which is ridiculous. Uh, it's a voluntary program. The inmates, uh, they, they want to do it. They get special housing. They, they, they reside in camps as opposed to on the prison grounds. They eat better food. Uh, just generally, life is much better uh, for them. But, yeah. but, but in return, we ask them to do a lot of hard work. Right. Uh, and they do it very, very well. Uh, that better than any professional firefighter, for sure. Um, when, when we see those folks show up on a fire, we just breathe a sigh of relief because we just don't want to do that much work. Right. Uh, and, and they just, they're experts at it. And so they killed the program. Um, How long ago was that? Last year. This is uh, our first real season where we're experiencing the aftermath of that good decision. Wow. Um, so what, what that means, Al, is that we effectively laid off hundreds of employees throughout right. the state. And, and we can't do without them. So yeah. we have to hire more firefighters, professional firefighters, to, to do that uh, for a lot more money and the benefits and, and all that. Now, these inmates that I spoke about, they get some money, too. They, they get a little money for, for their services. Right. Um, but I, I, I never met one of them who didn't love what they were doing. Right. Uh, well, they're gone, now we're paying a lot of money to replace them. And we're having a really hard time filling those slots so rapidly. And even when we do, uh, it's primarily with younger men and women, and they go to the academy, and when they find out what they're really going to be doing, they don't want to do that anymore. So they'll, they'll quit in week two or three of the academy. Oh. This is this is a, a countywide problem. Yeah. Well, uh, statewide, right, and, and and certainly a statewide, but we're we're really feeling it here in Calaveras County. Um, this first day I heard about this, and I'm wondering if maybe the public, um, all the public, doesn't not aware that this went on. Uh, I didn't see anything in the newspaper. I, I'm sure this is not very well known by the by the public. So. Part of the solution to that would be to try to get more public information about how important that program was and is. And then maybe uh, through the legislature, get some changes. The governor apparently is uh, ideologically uh, committed to not having the program, but the uh, uh, <laughs> this is not a dictatorship, and the legislature is supposed to be creating the laws, you know, not the governor. So the question is, how do you get the word out? Well, we're getting the word out right now with taxpayer alert. Correct. But uh, other than that, what, gee, that's a, that's a horrible thing. Yeah. Uh, so that goes to the next question, what can be done? given what we have now? Well, what can be done, you know, what we're uh, in the process of doing is uh, we're trying to raise revenue to add staffing throughout the county. And I don't know if you've heard about this, but there is a measure, it's Measure A, it's going to be on the November ballot, and it's going to provide for, assuming it's, it's approved, it's going to provide for a one cent per dollar sales tax that will be collected and then dispersed evenly throughout the county. So in this county we have nine fire districts and one fire department. The fire department being Angel City. They are the only incorporated city in Calaveras County 
concerned they're a fire department. That's, that's the only thing that's, that's unique about them. Everything else is the same. Um, so effectively, we have 10 fire organizations in the county. This tax measure, if it's approved, is expected to bring in um, five or so million dollars a year in annual revenue. If you have the same amount of sales. Yes, if, if the sales remain the same, right. um, it's probably likely, I think, that it will go up incrementally over time as more people come here and spend money uh, and pay more sales tax. Uh, and mind you, that doesn't include your groceries because you're not, these are, this is only tax on sales tax, and not everything is subject to sales tax, so right. your groceries, for example. Yeah. I understand that uh, on a positive side, uh, it sunsets in 10 years, is that right? I'm not sure about that. Okay. Um, but I, I will get to the group who probably knows the answer to that. But, but assuming it, it does sunset, yeah. then it's just a matter of, well, first of all, do you still need it, right? That's right. always why you have a sunset clause. Right. And if the answer is yes, we still need that funding, then we go back to the community and we ask for it. Yeah. Okay. Um, previous attempts to increase the sales tax uh, have met with failure. The, uh, <clears throat> the public uh, didn't like the idea of increasing the sales tax. And this uh, proposal that it would be specifically used for certain items I think brings in uh, the law that it would require uh, two-thirds passage before it could become law. Is that true? This particular measure requires 50% plus one of those folks who turn... Oh, okay. If it were general, if it went into the kitty, yeah. then it required two, three quarters. Two, okay. Three. Or, or two-thirds. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the other thing we um, are uh, going to do, uh, we did it before years ago, we stopped doing it, and that is to run another fire academy. So uh, right now, the Columbia College has a, uh, a wonderful fire science program that includes a full fire academy. Um, unfortunately, they're not producing the amount of firefighters we need right now. They were never set up to produce that many firefighters in a, in a year. So Copperopolis Fire used to run its own fire academy, yeah. and we're going to we're going to ramp that up again, and we're going to invite folks from other agencies to come attend our academy as well, so we can produce more firefighters. Huh. If um, if this measure measure A passes. <clears throat> with a 50% uh, majority, plus one, uh, can it be rescinded with a similar uh, majority? I don't know for sure. My guess is probably. Yeah, would there have to be something that would happen that would cause the tax to cause the voters to vote it vote it down? Let me give you an example. So this revenue, this, this new revenue, is um, only to be used for staffing. So if one or more fire agencies starts playing around with that money, then sure, the community could say, hey, that's not what we voted for. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that's something that could happen. And then they could have the recourse um, of, uh, of uh, rescinding it with a 50% plus one. Yeah. Okay. That takes uh, some of the some of the danger. One of the things about tax, and sales tax, is uh, our economy, uh, our businesses uh, are the, the basic are the foundation of our economy. Uh, we will become prosperous and have become pro prosperous when businesses. Have minimum taxation and regulation, uh, and they produce a lot. And a good part of our economy is uh, based on on uh, visitors and vacationers. Right. And so, 
if we burden their, they have so much in their budget for their getaway. And if we reduce, uh, say, 2%, the, uh, the amount of money that they uh, can have because they're being taxed indirectly, uh, which would be in the cost of their goods and services, uh, other than food, then uh, uh, the loss in uh, prosperity could exceed the benefit of having the, uh, the, the additional money come in. In other words, uh, you may have money for staffing, but you may not need so much staffing. <laughs> that would be a good problem to have. Yeah. Um, well, well, if we're talking about fire, yeah. we, we, but it's not just fire. This it's connected with roads sure. and with uh, all the other services too. Sure. Uh, one of the things that uh, w was considered w was these visitors and the many tourists who come up here to enjoy our beautiful county. Right. And what uh, what we know is they consume our services, right. but they don't pay. So you and I pay, because we're homeowners. All of the other homeowners pay for fire, law enforcement, et cetera. But these folks who come up to our, our beautiful county for recreation uh, and other things, they're not paying anything. They're not contributing. Uh, well, that's a very good point. But it probably needs to take in consideration increased sales. Uh, even though you don't change the sales tax, if you have increased sales, you have increased sales taxes coming in from your existing uh, uh, tax rate, not because you added something. And if you have a, uh, increased uh, income, then uh, uh, from the from the sales tax, then that kind of uh, helps in the staffing issue. And all the other things the money going needs money for it. Does it make sense? So now the more prosperous our, our community is, the more taxes that we get because there's more sales. Does that make sense? It makes sense, but we have two different, generally two different taxes that, that we're all uh, trying to get our hands on right. to do what we do. Uh, one of them is property tax. That's that's the big one. Right. Um, the other is sales tax, and then of course you have uh, some of us enjoy special taxes uh, for their particular community. Right. Um, what people don't know is, uh, and by the way, Copper Fire is the recipient uh, and the beneficiary of, of uh, some very generous special taxes. So our community said we want to pay more money to have paramedics and, and better fire. Well, we have a parcel tax for. Uh, I think it's $150. Yeah, it's $150 per house. Yeah, and uh, I think that's been very helpful uh, uh, for a copper fire. And they seem to be able to manage it pretty well. It doesn't seem to be squandered. <clears throat> it's managed very, very well. Um, we, uh, for example, we don't have any debt. We are about right. to take uh, delivery of a brand new fire engine that cost us, the taxpayers, uh, more than four hundred thousand dollars. We're paying cash for that. We're not financing anything, uh, and that's the way we like to handle our business. We don't want any debt. Right. We want to be able to pay our you know, our bills as we go, and uh, it's been very successful. We have uh, we're fortunate. We have a sizable reserve fund in case something should go wrong, in case we experience another downturn in the economy, which we expect to see here in the near future. I suspect you're right. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately. Yeah. But what people don't know is um, they don't know that uh, we are a very unique copper wire. It's unique in that we have that that extra money, and so we can deliver paramedic services through the fire district. Um, the other, by and large, the other districts cannot do that. The only other fire district that even provides paramedic service is Evans Pass, way up up the hill. Long ways down here. Long ways. Um, but they've responded here before in the middle of the night. I've, I've been there when they showed up. Wow. Um, 
But what's important is the other districts in the middle, they don't have that kind of revenue. Right. Not only do they not have it, they are woefully underfunded. And some of them are on, are on the brink of insolvency. Um, so why should that matter to the residents of Ebbets Pass or Copperopolis? Because we seem to be okay, right? Well, that's true, until we need help. Yeah. And when we need help in Copperopolis, we're, we're, we're looking for help, and I'm talking about we need help right now. Uh, we're looking toward Cal Fire. They're almost always there, but not always. Uh, then we have Altaville Maloney's Fire District and Angel City Fire. Right. That's who's coming to help us first. Right. But if they don't have a fire engine that's properly staffed, they cannot come to our party. Right. So it does matter uh, what's going on in Angel City. It does matter what's going on at Alta Gulf Maloney's and everywhere else. Because at the end of the day, when one of us needs help, we're all going to send whatever we can. Right. The, uh, <clears throat> the possibility of increasing staff, assuming that the, uh, the prisoner issue cannot be resolved. Uh, it seemed like to increase staff, you need to uh, uh, recruit more people, which means you have to have outreach. Uh, and probably, uh, you, uh, since this is a long-term uh, consideration, you probably need to reach out to youth in the schools. You need to get uh, speakers in the schools to talk about the joys of putting fires out. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, to develop enthusiasm and, and more uh, people that want to do that. Also, I understand there's a certain amount of volunteer fire people. I don't know what percentage of uh, firefighters are voluntary. Well, historically, uh, it's been close to, uh, very close to 100%. In, in, in most of the districts. Oh, um, I never knew that. Yeah, it's uh, almost 100% uh, staffed by, what well, well, was, by volunteers. What's happened over the years, though, is the, um, you know, your, your average uh, man or woman who, who, who bumps their head and thinks they want to volunteer uh, you know, firefighting, yeah. uh, many of them work. They, they have a job. So they only have so much time to commit. And for many years, that's not really been an issue. They, their time is, is going to be consumed mostly by training, uh, because they have to be trained. Right. Um, and then uh, actually responding to incidents, uh, which of course, they, uh, depending on where they work and what their boss thinks of this good idea, uh, they might be able to free, be free to leave work, for example, if you work at the grocery store, they'll probably let you go fight a fire in Copperopolis. Uh, but not all employers are, are that understanding. And, uh, but most importantly, the just the minimum training required now of a volunteer firefighter is the same as a, as a career firefighter. Uh, Which is what? I, I'm not even sure what the hours are, but, but it's untenable for, for many people who would like to do something like this. Right. Um, and, and every year, they're adding more stuff, and it's mostly uh, safety related. Uh, but it seems like every year they're adding a couple more hours of mandatory training. Hmm. Well, it seemed like uh, the grunt work of clearing brush and doing backfires is what the uh, prisoners were doing. They were doing uh, a lot of what we, we, we call cutting lines. So uh, if we have a fire, you would like that fire to stop at a certain point. Right. And you, you use, if you can, ideally you want to use a bulldozer to cut a big line yeah. that that fire hopefully will not cross. But in the absence of a bulldozer, they can't get into every tight place. It's manpower. Uh, men mm -hmm. and women who are going to go with hand tools right. and cut that line for you. Oh, so. There's not a lot of romance to uh, grubbing in the dirt. <laughs> no. <laughs> but 
there is a, a, there is a, a joy in doing something important for the community that a lot of people look for those opportunities. Well, uh, we did uh, create, um, it's probably been maybe, you know, time flies now as we get older. Yeah. But maybe seven or so years ago, in this county, we created a, what's it called, a, a CERT team, a Community Emer Emergency Response Team. And those are also volunteers. All of them are volunteers. Uh, they perform an important role in the fire service and in their communities um, by uh, providing fire support, meaning um, they'll set up, they'll have plenty of uh, chilled waters, bottled, bottled waters for, for the crews. Uh, they will help rehab uh, firefighters who are suffering some level of heat distress uh, perhaps give them oxygen, give, give, them, give them water, yeah. give them vitals, and, and generally watch them while they rest and hopefully recover enough to get back on the line. But sometimes uh, they, they don't go back on the line, they, they need to go home. Um, and, and, and that requires far, far less training than, than firefighter. Is that still in existence? Absolutely. You, you can go anywhere in this county, there's going to be a CERT team nearby. C C E R T. That stands for Community Emergency Response Team. Okay. Now, did you write that down? Yeah. <laughs> okay. We want to we want to get people to inquire to get to be part of the CERT team so we can we can have solutions to this problem. Yeah. And they're trained over time uh, in basic first aid, CPR. And, and, and those kinds of things. What they're not trained on is how to enter and more importantly get out of a burning building. Uh, they do not engage in wildland firefighting. Yeah. And therefore, they don't need all that training. But they would be able to recruit, help recruit more people that can fill, fill that gap, maybe. Yes. They also get involved in traffic control, uh, other community events. Uh, they, they do a lot of things, a lot of important work. Uh, that, that we just don't have the resources to do otherwise. Yeah, and then of course, uh, uh, increased awareness among the community is probably the key thing. Just like I didn't know that that uh, all our uh, prisoners were fired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they weren't sent home. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> that uh, so having uh, increased awareness, so. We need to be able to communicate better with the uh, with the community, so that uh, outfits like CERT can become more effective and grow. Yeah, makes sense. Yes. All right. Well, we've uh, we completed our interview, and uh, want to thank you for watching Taxpayer Alert, and we'll see you next time. Okay.